Hello everyone, my name is Eric Jones, better known as the Turf Teacher. Welcome to the lecture entitled Cultural Management for Turf Grasses. This information comes directly from Chapter 2 in your Ornamental and Turf Grass Pest Management Manual. This is also the first lecture in Unit 3, so welcome to Unit 3. You guys and gals have already worked hard in both Units 1 and 2, and now we're ready to dig in and grab some of the meat and potatoes of what it takes to be a pesticide applicator uh, in the state of North Carolina. And we're going to start out with turf grasses. So uh, Unit 3 is all about the turf grasses, the insects, the disease, the weeds, the cultural practices, and then Unit 4, you will see uh, the same for ornamentals and shrubs. So, But let's go ahead and get started with Unit 3 and go ahead and get started with our objectives for this lecture. We're going to identify our geographic location. Guys, I live in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, so I'm in that transition zone. I'm where we could have warm season or cool season grasses. We're going to list at least four of the major cool season grasses. Then we're going to list uh, at least four of the major warm season grasses. We're going to identify three site problems that can contribute to poor turf stands and pest problems. And then we're going to identify four mistakes in turf plant management that can contribute to poor turf stands and pest problems. Now, most of you guys are already working in the field, so you're starting to think in your mind of situations that you've already seen on your client's homes or what you've seen um, uh, in your horticulture studies. So guys, it's a lot of this could be review for you, but a lot of this is good information and I like touching base on it. So if you haven't read your chapter, go ahead and pause the video. It's a short video. It's a short lecture. Uh, go ahead and pause the video, read the chapter. I just read the chapter. I always read the chapter prior to giving you guys the information uh, in a lecture. So uh, uh, just freshen up on it. It's good stuff. So cultural management. Um, good turf management includes the proper cultivar selection. It also includes proper site preparation, the proper maintenance of the turfs, and then the correct water and fertilizer. Now, each one of those guys, the cultivar selection, you may need to select the type of turf suited for the situation. We need to know what they are. First of all, we need to know if we're planting a warm season or if we're planting a cool season grass. Now, here in Winston-Salem, we're gonna see probably, I'd say 98% of our clients are tall fescue, they are the cool season grasses. We have very few clients that have a warm season grass. It's still, I don't know if I'd say new to the area, but people in this realm, they just want the cool season grasses. And as a landscaper or a landscape professional, horticulture professional, you're probably gonna like the tall fescue and the cool season grasses uh, because you get to do the aeration and seeding. I mean, it is a, continuous thing that you're going to have to do. I mean, you're going to need to plug and seed every fall. Um, the grasses get stressed out in the summertime, so it's a good time to do that. You know, the warm season grasses, you may overseed with rye, um, but they're just, they're more maintainable. You don't have to do as much and just, um, but I'll be honest with you, the cool season grasses look better. You can stripe them better. They've got that darker, greener color. They just look better and I prefer them. Um, by a long shot. Now, however, if I did have a swimming pool, I would want a warm season grass uh, around and about our swimming pools so I could mimic the areas of uh, places that we go on vacation, like the beach and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, we are, uh, I would guess, say lucky that we could actually choose um, whether we wanted a warm season or cool season grass. Proper, uh, proper site preparation, a lot of times, guys, you know, you're not prepping the soil. You're not adding the amendments that it needs. You're not doing the soil test. You're not adding the correct amount of lime before you either seed it or before you put down the sod. Here is a sod application in rolls. You can see that the, uh, the ground is in pretty good shape there, nice color, very few rocks. It's been raked clean and the sod's laying down on nice uh, prepped uh, soil bed. Proper maintenance and turf, you know, whether you're mowing it at the correct height, you're giving it amount, enough amount of water and fertilize, which is in the last step, but also uh, guys, are you plugging and seeding? Are you dethatching? Are you removing the thatch? So all that comes with the, uh, the proper maintenance of turf. And again, water's a big issue. Here lately, we've had a lot of rain. We've had a wet year, to be honest with you. Uh, but another thing happens with water. And, and if you're in the irrigation business too, I mean, we are, we install a lot of systems a year. When you install a system, and you give the homeowner control of that controller, they're gonna mess it all up. 
they're going to be giving it too much water. They're going to run it uh, day and night. They want to show that thing off. You're going to have to check that. And if you're even in the turf grass industry and you're not messing with the irrigation, you need to know the water requirements of this turf grass and you should be able to go out and determine whether or not your client's messing with the controller. Is it too wet? Is it not wet enough? You should be able to identify those uh, situations, whether it's getting too much or not enough water. And so your selection, guys, the site use, what is it for? Is this a ball field that needs the warm season grass? Is it a golf course? Is it a residential lawn? Is it a school property? You know, schools are going to have a lot of foot traffic. Students are going to cut across campus. They're not going to walk down the sidewalks. We see it here all the time. Students cut across the shortest path. And I always tell them, that's where we need to pour the sidewalks. No, don't spend money pouring sidewalks yet. Let the students to determine where they need those sidewalks. Then we can pour it. Um, but you need to figure out what it's for, the site use. And is it going to be a warm season or cool season grass? Most golf courses uh, are going to have warm season grasses unless they use like a bent grass uh, for their... Uh, uh, for their greens and tee boxes and that again is um, a whole different situation. It is a cool season grass that really really gets stressed out in the summertime. You're going to have to cool it off with big fans, keep it wet. There's a lot of work to it so uh, you may or may not see that. I've seen it here at a local golf course. They've since redone it but I remember the guys pulling out the big um, fans that were on tractors and they would pull them out and you know certain times of the day they just have to cool the greens off when it got too hot the climate what is the climate well there's three major regions uh here in north carolina we have the uh, mountains piedmont and the coastal plain and that extends all the way down into south carolina and georgia guys we have the mountains piedmont and coastal plain we are in the piedmont where i'm at and we're also in that transition zone where we could have the warm season and the cool season grasses. Um, some of your cool season grasses, guys, there, there's cultivars of those. We've got the creeping bent grass, which we were just talking about on the golf courses. Uh, we've got tall fescue, the fine fescues, which will include creeping red, hard, and chewings. I have you know, dealt with each one of those turf grasses, perennial rye and Kentucky bluegrass. I have a large section of my yard done in Kentucky bluegrass that uh, uh, my grandparents did years and years ago. Uh, warm season grass, Bermuda grass, common in the hybrid. Then we have centipede grass, uh, Baja grass, uh, or Bahia, and then St. Augustine's, Zoysia, Seashore, um, uh, Paspalum, and then carpet grass. What we're going to see here, though, guys, is either going to be Bermuda or Zoysia. The other ones you'll see more towards the coast, but you are not going to uh, uh, see them here in the Piedmont, only Bermuda or Zoysia. But there's a lot of, um, a lot of centipede done on the coast, um, even St. Augustine's, but the guys that I'm going to around doing the seminars, uh, they don't care too much for the St. Augustine. Um, but guys, make sure you get certified turf grass seed if you're doing the uh, the tall fescues. Yeah, you can get some Bermuda seed, but most of that stuff, your warm season grass, you're going to install by sod or plugs or sprigs. Uh, you will seed some of your cool season grasses or most of your cool season grasses, or you can purchase the sod for them too. But make sure you're getting certified grass seed. Make sure that it's certified to be a certain high, high percentage of weed free uh, seeds, but then you know there's cultivars and there's blends, guys. For your turf grass, um, your cultivars are genetically different groups within a species. You would uh, want to choose a cultivar that's resistant to some of the disease uh, that are that are already out there. Um, you know there are some cultivars that have improved resistance to uh, leaf spot, rust, and dollar spot. And you may also find one. Uh, the perennial rye grasses uh, or tall fescues that contains a fungus that will be resistant to, uh, will cause it to be resistant to certain uh, insects. If you're going to use a blend, well, you need to use a blend when you're doing uh, your fescues, guys. Get one that's got at least three blends in it. That way, in case one of the, uh, the turf grasses does um, get infected by a disease, it's not going to wipe out the entire lawn. It's only going to wipe out a third of it because you're using a three uh, three seed blend for it. And you'll see these called contractors blend, landscapers choice, things of that nature when you go uh, to the nurseries and, and into the uh, landscape supply houses to, uh, to purchase your seed. 
Site prep, guys, make sure that you got good drainage. You don't want anywhere in your lawn to be saturated and water just stand. You're creating a perfect opportunity for disease there. Make sure that you've got good airflow and that you've got some sunlight hitting those uh, turf grass areas. You don't want it to stay uh, shady because it's just not going to, um, to do good there. Um, you might want to remove the tree branches, limbing them up, allowing that light to come in. The, um, the trees are going to also restrict the airflow. You want good airflow um, and the sunlight to hit your, um, your turf grass in your lawns. Proper mowing. Guys, you need to mow it at the correct height. The book's got some, uh, some good information there on page 29. Uh, I would almost raise it a little bit higher. I'm um, talking with when, when we're talking about our fescues, you know, they're saying fine fescue, inch and a half to two and a half, tall fescue, uh, two to three and a half. Guys, we're going to mow it at a minimum of three and a half. Sometimes we're going to raise our decks up to four inches. The higher you raise your, uh, your mowing height, the less weeds that you're going to have, the less... Um, chance of anything really happening. When you start cutting it short, guys, you're gonna you're just gonna develop problems. You're gonna allow more light down into uh, the area, um, which will help germinate weed seeds. Um, you're gonna have Bermuda start cro encroaching in on your um, your tall fescues. That that height of your fescue is going to choke out the Bermuda. So mow it at four inches, three and a half, uh, you know, that's as low as you'd want to go on your fescue grasses that we're going to see here in this area. Uh, dethatching, you know, you want to, uh, to kind of control the thatch. Some thatch is good, but thatch is um, the layer of living and dead plant stems, leaves, and roots that develops between the soil surface and the green vegetation. Uh, vegetation. Um, anything that gets over half inch thick, uh, will keep light and everything from reaching down there. So you'd want to remove that. We primarily would thatch uh, most of our customers each year. It just depends on the, the stand. We would go out and we would uh, inspect for it and see if there was a lot of thatch. Uh, I like thatching before we do the, the plugging and seeding. So we get all that, that brown muck that you can see. I mean, here's a great picture of it. They are dethatching the yard here. What that is removing is removing that, that thickness of just brown almost dead looking grass, but remember some of it is living. Removing that, that allows more air, more light to get down there, and then we can go in and plug and seed it um, and actually do good. Now, if you can look at the other picture here where it says thatch half inch or less is okay. It's allowing water to get down through there. Look at all the nitrogen and potassium, phosphorus, all of that is able to get down into the soil. And you can actually see the depths of the, um, the grass roots there, uh, a lot healthier than the ones on the left that has thatch of one inch or more. Um, aerating, irrigating, fertilizing. Guys, aeration is key to the cool season grasses. You're gonna have to do it, especially here uh, when the grasses, you know, our cool season grasses, they suffer in June and July when it gets hot. However, guys, we have had a mild June so far. I'm recording this lecture in, in, in the month of June. We've had a pretty decent uh, summer so far. We've had some nice cool days uh, and it's been nice, super nice. And that's good for the grass. It was good for our strawberries having the cooler weather this year. But we're going to have to aerate in the fall. That's just part of it. We include that in our turf care program. It's there for it. Irrigation again, guys, you got to make sure you have the correct amount of water. You know, it's better to, to do it once a week. You know, most turf grasses need that one inch range uh, over the week, but it's good to do it in one application if at all possible, except when you're newly establishing a lawn. Sod's going to require it every day. You don't want it to dry out. You want to keep it wet until the roots take hold. And then even new seeds, they're going to need watering every day, but very lightly. So you're going to water frequently, but not for any length of time. And then when the grass gets established, you will uh, decrease the frequency and actually uh, increase the amount that you're putting on it. And then fertilizing, guys, um, your pesticide dealers that we talked about in unit one and unit two, um, they'll have turf care programs that um, 
are, are good for your region. You know, so that's a good um, good place to start if you don't know what kind of fertility program to put your clients on. But you know, but study that and research it, and come up with a good fertility plan for uh, for your customers. But you want to make sure that you're hitting uh, the correct amount of nitrogen for your target grass. You need to know the grass and then know what uh, what it needs. And that concludes chapter two. Uh, in your uh, ornamental and turf grass pest management manual. Guys, I appreciate it, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you.